Right. Welcome, everyone. I'm Sam Toby. I'm the gallery director of the University Hall Gallery at UMass Boston. Um, thank you for tuning in tonight. Uh, we are operating remotely throughout the fall semester and um, possibly into the spring semester as well. Um, so we're going to be hosting a series of artist talks, um, as well as some online exhibitions coming up in the, in the coming months. Um, tonight, we're very pleased to be presenting an artist talk by Del uh, M. Hamilton, um, who is joining us from Jamaica Plain. Um, and just to plug another artist talk that we're going to be giving next week with Jillian Freyer, um, that's going to be on November 19th. Um, and I'll paste a link in the chat once um, we get started with Del's talk. Um, so hi, Del. Um, thanks for joining us tonight. Good. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. Um, Del and I uh, have known each other for a few years now, and I've been really excited to be able to host her um, here online um, and hopefully work with her again in the future at some point. Um, and Del will be giving a, about a 15 to 20 minute artist talk um, on some, um, some performance works, and um, then we'll be getting into a bit of a Q&A section um, where you'll be able to, pay, to type in questions and comments um, into the chat. Um, or the Q&A tabs, uh, which you should be able to see in your interface on Zoom. Um, and at that point, we'll try to keep it pretty interactive just so that we keep um, uh, the conversation going and allow you all to kind of participate um, in the tra trajectory of the talk. Um, so just some more formal uh, introduction, introduction for Del. Um, Del Marie Hamilton is an interdisciplinary artist, writer, and independent curator whose visual art practice spans a variety of mediums, including performance, video, painting, and photography. Um, you can see an image of her work here on the screen. Uh, she earned a BA in journalism from Northeastern University and an MFA in studio art from the School of Museum Fine Arts and Tufts University. Hamilton has presented her artwork in exhibitions and institutions such as the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, the ICA Boston and the Rhode Island School of Design Art Museum, among other national and international institutions. Recently, Dell became the first visual artist to present a performance artwork at the Clark Institute in Williams, Williamstown, which opened to the public in 1955. Um, in 2019, she participated in the 13th Havana Biennial as part of Maria Magdalena Compos Bones curatorial project, Intermittent Rivers which was ranked by hyperallergic.com as one of 2019's top international exhibitions. The same year, uh, Dell also presented her first solo exhibition, All Languages Wel Welcomed Here, um, which you can see in our, the artwork that's um, on your screen is uh, an installation view from that exhibition. Um, and the exhibition was reviewed in the NKA Journal of Contemporary African Art uh, by Sylvie Nachi. In her art, in Dell's artistic practice, um, she uses the body to investigate the social and geopolitical constructions of memory, gender, history, and citizenship. With roots in Belize, Honduras, and the Caribbean, she frequently draws upon the personal experiences of her family, as well as the folkloric traditions and histories of the region. Uh, you can find more uh, about her artwork on social media on Twitter and Instagram um, at Dell and Hamilton, and on her website. DellandHamilton.com, um, both of which I'll put in the chat as well. Um, it's Dell's mixture of intuitive improvisational experimentation and her personal scholarly insights that I was first drawn to when I met her in 2015. Uh, she has, the, has a propensity for delving just as deeply into the subjectivity of her work as, as she does in the materiality of her artworks. Uh, I'm, th I'm, I'm thrilled to be hosting Dell at this particular moment uh, as her work has an indelible political and civic bent. As, as we all wade through a particularly historic moment amid a pivotal presidential election, a renewed and ongoing civic uprising for racial justice, and as we enter, the new, uh, uh, enter a new and challenging phase of the coronavirus pandemic, we as a society, as participants of our various cultures, need to look more closely at work of artists like Dell who bravely attempt to unveil truths that are large in societal and historical scale but show also the importance of empathy and vulnerability. Um, so everyone, please, uh, you know, from your homes, um, please help me and uh, join me in welcoming uh, Del Hamilton. Thanks for joining us, Del. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Sam, for that really wonderful um, introduction. This is this Zoom thing, I'll, I'm gonna just say, right, um, this will never feel normal to me, be, partly because, 
of the way that I make my work. It's in sight. It's in the relationship with other people. So I would love to see all your faces, um, but we're living amidst a pandemic. So we'll just have to <laughs> do what we can to get through this. I'm going to do this whole share screen thing now. Cool. Okay. I guess you guys can see my screen now, correct? Um, I don't think it's come up yet. You need to select the presentation. Okay, hold on one second. Let me do that. Go back to my screen, share. There you go. Got it. So you guys can see it now. Yeah, and I think, again, you want to just bring up the slide. Yep. There? Perfect. Thanks Excellent. So Super duper. Um, again, like I said, I want to really thank um, Sam and UMass Boston um, for inviting me to do this talk and for you guys being here with us um, this evening. I also need to give a shout out to the Hutchins Center um, for African and African American Research. Um, that is my day job. I feel really lucky to have a job right now in this moment, but also too with some really amazing colleagues. Um, without their support, I wouldn't have the time and the flexibility to sustain my practice. I always like to start my talk with um, some images of what my studio looks like, which is where the magic happens, as you can see. It's pretty craptastic. It's always pretty messy. Um, under the hashtag hot studio messness on my IG handle, I'm often taking pictures of like all the mess that I'm usually wading through when I'm making work. So. Um, that's kind of where the chaos begins and then eventually art comes out of this process. Uh, here's, all, here's a photo of Francis Bacon in his crazy studio. And then here is Bruce Nauman in his studio. So I feel like I'm in very good company when it comes to messy and obsessive um, art making. When I first began my graduate work at the School Museum of the Fine Arts, the SMFA, I found that my work didn't fit into neat categories. I also think because I have an undergrad degree in journalism, um, that first year of art school, I felt really lost at sea, and I didn't really figure things out until I had to come up with my own definition of art. And you see it on the screen here. Art is an investigation, a restless questioning, and a longing for answers. The key words here being restless questioning, which for me means that I'm always interested in articulating and proposing questions that help me make meaning of the world as well as my place in it. Looking back on things now, I realized that even while I was getting a journalism degree and engaging with the medium of photography, I've always had questions about how to use the body to explore personal memory and gender. This image is from a series I created in undergrad called Infrared Body, which questions at the time um, that I was wrestling with were related to W.B. Du Bois's concept of double consciousness. I also wanted to ask, how do I fashion the self in the aftermath of growing up in a really chaotic as well as abusive home? Um, how are our identities fashioned within contemporary and familial social, social constructs? By the time I got to grad school, I wanted to dive deeper into the symbiotic relationship between history and image making. And this image here is from a video piece called Desire and Shop at Duchamp. Um, and it was recently shown in um, 2017 at BU in an um, exhibition uh, organized by Lynn Cooney and Kimber Tuning called Occupancies. I'll also be discussing this piece at the MLA, the Modern Language Association's annual conference um, next year. The conceptual framework for Desire and Duchamp explores the representations of Black women's bodies, in particular the exploitative display of Sarah Bertman, known as the Venus Hottentot, who toured Europe from 1810 to 1815. Because the depiction and display of Sarah Bertman is so notorious, Several contemporary Black women artists and writers, including Barbara Chase Rouveau, Bernie Searle, Renee Green, and Lorna Simpson have commented on Bartman's life. I note here the work of Renee Cox on the cover of Black Venus 2010, They Called Her Hot and Tot, an anthology edited by Deborah Willis. Bartman's touring throughout Europe caused such a sensation that scientific study of her body was headed up by French naturalist Jean Cuvier and supported by the French government. What is also important to note here is that several 19th century artists were implicated in this notorious history, 
by creating multiple renderings of Bartman's body. And here you see this drawing by Jean-Baptiste Ferry. Another thread that inflects um, Desire and Duchamp is Edward Muybridge's motion studies, which were considered scandalous by 19th century audiences, as well as Duchamp's canonical 1912 painting, The Descending Staircase. And with both of these two artists and makers, um, image makers, they very much, from my point of view, were anticipating moving image, which obviously feeds into my into the video project itself of Desire and Duchamp. I was also very much thinking about um, Carrie Mae Weems' work, Not My Nays Type. This is an image from that series, and I'll read the quote. It was clear I was not my nays type. Picasso, who had a way with women, only used me, and Duchamp never even considered me. While I'm still interested in the construction of a self, over time, my work shifted into performance art, which provided an immediacy in its ab ability to respond to current social conditions. Performance art also helped broaden the reception of my work by grounding it in site-specific locations and time-based practices. Using my body as a vehicle also taps into the complex questions that ask, what does it mean to have once been considered a mere object, a thinking property, versus the present, where my personhood is considered a threat depending upon the cultural context. Here is an image from a piece called CDB, my, basically my first commissioned performance right out of grad school. So I graduated in 2012, this was, uh, this was in um, October of 2013. So this is, as I said, the work is called Columbus Day Blues. I performed it on um, Columbus Day itself when the MFA is open and free and um, it's open to the public. And so there was quite a bit of traffic that particular day. Um, and it starts pretty much with me uh, eating brown and decaying Chiquita bananas while sitting outside of one of the cafes within the museum. And as Sam said, because I have roots in Belize and Honduras as well as the Caribbean, obviously as a result of slavery and colonization, this particular performance is informed by some of my previous research work, which investigated the corrosive and corruptive histories of United Fruit Company, which is now Chiquita Brands. The company's history was also birthed in Boston and several of, it, of its executives went to the Harvard Business School. Um, Harvard Business School's library has a massive archive, like thousands of images of United Fruit Company's plantations. With this performance, I was also very much interested in the public sphere of museums and how they co-construct both national and international narratives. This piece is also informed by Adrian Pine's book, Working Hard and Drinking Hard on Violence and, and Survival in Honduras. Um, for me, this book was pretty personal, substance abuse, addiction that runs throughout my family as well. And it's not really till you become an adult and sort of have done lots of work in um, therapy where you realize, you know, the addiction or the substance abuse stuff is a symptom. It's not really the, the real root cause of things. Um, there's also another really important book that I was referencing and when I was thinking about this particular performance, as well as other um, research projects, um, Glenn Chambers' book, Race, Nation, and West Indian Immigration, 200 us, 1890 to 1940. Chambers' work was especially important in accounting for the histories of the forgotten Black bananeros who were actively recruited by United Fruit Company to work on the plantations um, from the late 19th century and into the 20th century. And my family um, did also were also um, employees and laborers that worked on these plantations. Chambers also discusses the racism that Black Anglo Bananeros encountered working for the company and how they were pitted against Spanish speaking and indigenous labor populations. For the performance, I roved through the contemporary art galleries named for the Lindy family. I used red strips of fabric that were excised from the American flag to wipe up the dust as you see along the wall here. I then walked into another gallery where there was an exhibition that was already being staged. It's called, it was called um, She Who Tells a Story. Um, while I was in that space, I broke out into song and sung the hook from, from Supremes' I'm Gonna Make You Love Me. This next image is where I laid down in the front of Carol Walker's work by saying um, Yankee Doodle Dandy while pushing and scraping myself along the floor on my back. Towards the end of the performance, I verbalized incantations in Spanish, spun myself dizzy while also switching between lying still and walking backwards on my hands. 
With this performance, I was also really interested in who gets to be a citizen and who has to live in the shadows. This is an image from a 13 hour performance called Where Else Williamsburg. This was another roving performance to map and experience the historical monuments and public spaces of Williamsburg. As I've said, I'm always aware of my body's relationship to time, to pace and scale and distance. For this project, I was also considering the who-ness and the awareness of my experiences. Um, for example, because Williamsburg happens to be um, this you know, hip art, uh, artist neighborhood now. So basically, if you, write, do you, if you live in that zip code, does that automatically automate you, make you cooler? Does that make you a really productive artist? I don't know um, in those kinds of equations, but those are some of the things I was thinking about at the time. Um, and while making this piece, I was also very much thinking about how we're always tethered to our digital screens and our phones. Um, our gadgets tell us that the world is knowable, that it um, can be critiqued and that it can be measured. Um, but I always was wondering as well, as I'm using the GPS to find my way to different sites, whose body is being used to map and measure these walking distances. This image here is um, where the end of the performance took place. It's a um, plaza called Continental Army Plaza which greets you at the front, at the foot of the Williamsburg Bridge as you head into Manhattan. That site symbolizes a period of the American Revolution when George Washington was encamped during a really severe winter. Through drawing my footsteps, as I encircled the structure, I marked out a space for myself in the face of the history that regularly leaves out the stories and contributions of Black women. For the folks who are asking, how do you make art via walking as aesthetic action? I'll say that not long after I did that performance, the Decor of a Museum and Sculpture Park organized an exhibition by, curated by Lexi Lee Sullivan called Walking Sculpture, which included the work of other artists who also incorporate walking into their art practices, including Michelangelo Pistoletto, uh, Helen Mira Popel, and Paolo Nazareth. So this here, yep, this is an image of a performance called Blue's Blank Black, which I created in Brooklyn at the Five Miles Gallery in 2016. I developed the piece for a collaborative curatorial program called Black Girl Lit, which included the work of Helena Metaferia, Ayana Evans, Sade McConan, and Marceline Mondang. At the time, the piece was completely improvised and featured one character. I'll see that I don't normally improvise pieces. It, that ended up happening partly because we were you know, getting getting the space nailed down, buying the booze, doing MC, doing the MCing, handing out programs in that sort of kind of flurry and putting together this event um, with these other amazing artists. I sort of forgot to figure out my own piece. Um, I had the framework and I had been uh, rereading the work of Toni Morrison, but what the piece looked like once I sort of got out there with all the materials and objects, that was sort of a piece that I sort of made up on the fly. I was also um, very much stationary and in one corner for that particular performance. Uh, this image now, uh, this is from when I performed the piece uh, for the second time at Harvard's Cooper Gallery. So first I did it in May in 2016 and then in December at the Cooper Gallery. The piece is essentially a eulogy and invokes the names of black women who have been killed by police officers. Women such as Sandra Bland, Tatiana Jefferson, and most recently, Breonna Taylor. It uses gestures, color, and repetition to tell the audience about the lives of these women. This piece is also laden with the work, as I said, of Toni Morrison and her two most well-known novels, probably most taught ones, The Bluest Eye and Beloved. It also incorporates Central American folklore, folklore figures of La Llorona and La Sucia. When I performed the piece in Cambridge, I was able to incorporate movement and the piece unfolded in three parts with three separate characters. In part one, I play a bluesy torch singer who sings the hook from the American classic, Why Was I Born? For part two, I appear as La Sucia, a jilted bride who was left at the altar because she was not baptized. In earnest and in heartbreak, she chooses to never take off her most prized possession, her bridal gown. For part three, I morph into La Llorona, a woman dressed in black and trapped in time for the crime of murdering her children and her husband as she finds out, as she finds out that he's been cheating on her. 
in these subsequent images, uh, these are from when I performed the piece um, in 2018 in Tulsa at the Living Arts Gallery for Juneteenth. By the end of the performance, I'm pretty ragged. Um, it's a very difficult performance in terms of content, but also in, in physicality. This is an image from when I performed the piece in Cuba for um, Intermittent Rivers um, in Matanzas, Cuba for the Havana Biennial. Throughout the performance, I'm shifting between passages from Morrison, Morrison's books in both English and in Spanish. I'm shifting between singing and shouting. I'm also continuing to work more names of deceased Black women, such as Alicia Thomas, Rakia Boyd, and Deborah Danner. All of these women were once babies. They were someone's little girl. They were mothers. They were sisters. They were our aunts and our cousins. These are images from a piece called This Is All We Have, which I first performed at the BCA's Mills Gallery in 2018. I also performed this piece at Salem State University in 2019. Because I've only presented this piece a couple of times, I feel as though I could really push it a lot farther, depending upon the context and the right circumstances. I very much want to dig further into the concept of the plantation ocene, a term coined by Donna Haraway and Anna Singh. The plantation ocene, which in contrast to the Anthropocene, takes seriously the long-term agricultural impact of the transatlantic slave trade and racial capitalism. In this piece, I am invoking dialogue um, from Scholar O'Hara in Gone with the Wind. I enter the space by pushing this dresser into the space while I'm wearing this um, very baroque looking also wedding gown. I then change from Abe Lincoln into Obama, into Trump, and then a border patrol agent, and then eventually myself. Um, for this performance, I think again, if I am able to presented in another way, another context, another location. I'm very much interested in trying to piece through these questions of our current and ongoing social um, collapse of our, de of our democracy, and also to very much these questions um, about where we are now and where we go from here. Um, again, given as you know, as Sam outlined at the start, um, that we're in, we're heading into a new presidency, um, but also to living through this pandemic. So I'll stop there so that I'm not, again, over lecturing at you guys. Um, Sam, do you want to try to bring up some of the other images, uh, the 2D work or curatorial stuff? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, if you want to talk a little bit about your recent exhibition um, and this piece that we that I had um, up during my introduction. Oh, um, the beast. Yeah, yeah. So so I mean, if you, if you can maybe talk a little bit too about like working in between um, practices in between performance and then also like this, um, you know, really gestural um, collage and sculptural dr drawing and um, okay. uh, work that you're doing in your studio. Yeah, the way that they relate to one another, um, I will say that I think that when I made the shift from photo into performance art in grad school, I didn't, I didn't anticipate A, that I would even go down this performance art path, it really sort of kind of opened up these new questions. Over time, I realized um, in 2015, I was finishing up some work at a performance that was organized by Danielle Abrams. She put together a piece called Hung Out to Dry at the ICA, and it was in conversation with the Black Mountain um, College exhibition, and, and juxtaposing that with busing in Boston and the anti-segregation um, court cases, right, out of coming out of like Judge Garrity's chambers. And I remember that um, at the time I was cast as um, Louise uh, Day Hicks. And so she was a anti-busing um, politician. She was on the city council. She ran for um, Congress, incredibly vocal, um, but ha again, being cast, a black woman being cast as a, a white woman who's a, a anti-busing um, politician. That in itself is a mental shift, and but I really appreciated what Danielle was trying to do in that piece because he she also cast um, one of my one of our classmates Ryan, who's a guy. She cast him as Zora Neale Hurston, so she was really trying to kind of turn these tables in on themselves and sort of um, interrogate again all these kinds of social functions, um, social and cult cultural functions of who who is one person versus another person, race, gender, all of those kinds of things. But I remember when I did the piece, after I finished the piece, I kind, I felt really, um, really kind of drained 
uh, we were in rehearsals for many, many weeks, learning lines and different kinds of movements and projecting to the audience. Um, I hadn't performed in a play in a really long, long time. So it, it was a huge kind of mental shift. Pro and prior to that, I had just did a project with Illuminous, um, which was a kind of um, open mic poetry um, uh, night and performance that we did for the Illuminous Festival where we used Periscope, where we kind of live streamed poetry reading um, uh, that was being, uh, that we developed on site with either um, invited guests or people coming up for open mic. And so between those two projects, I was fairly done. By the time I get back to my studio, I'm kind of sitting around in that messy studio and I don't really know where to start. And pretty soon as I normally do, I just keep showing up to the studio. And even when no ideas are happening, I just kind of keep going and try to just again, work through whatever those blocks are. Pretty soon I started drawing again, which I hadn't done in many, many years, but my hands just kind of were guiding me and telling me what to do. And so over time I was working on, you know, much smaller pieces on the wall and then just kind of looking for whatever paper I had in the studio. And again, trying to continue to kind of like manipulate paper, paint on it, tear it apart, throw, you know, um, liquids on it, all kinds of different things. So over time, the work went from being really small, more like, you know, 15 by 20 inches into this piece, which is more like 10 by eight or something like that. And they just kind of grew and grew and grew. What I found through that process is that because I had done so much performance artwork, that in and of itself kind of taught me how to be in my body. And by knowing how to manipulate my body, it, that all sort of trickled down to how I moved my hands, how I held a brush, how I held you know, the charcoal, how I manipulated things on a different surface. So for me, I very much feel that um, performance art made me a better artist in all the other mediums that I work in. Um, this particular piece, Leviathan, the reason why it's called the beast um, it's an it, a he, I'm assuming at this point, but it very much is about um, A, the fact that my mom read me Bible stories when I was a kid. Um, her father, her grandfather was a pastor and actually started a school in Honduras. Um, but, you know, so between a school and, and church is where my mom's sort of life always kind of um, landed when she was growing up in Honduras. But um, yeah, so she read me a lot of Bible stories. I do remember um, a passage about this kind of sea monster called Leviathan. And it, as it turns out, this has some relationship to Lovecraft Country, which is about um, this writer, H.P. Lovecraft. But this notion of the Kraken, the sea monster, this unknowable octopus-like you know, thing with all of these tentacles that lives in the ocean that we're all kind of terrified, right? And this particular figure shows up in Greek mythology as well as like in 20,000 Leaves Under the Sea. But for me, these kinds of tentacle-like you know, strips of paper and fabric and color for me, that's so much about my relationship to my parents. Um, mm -hmm. And again, being aware of how I'm manipulating color and the materials on the surface, I'm often kind of, you know, rubbing things in with my with my hands. I take the piece off the wall, I put it on the floor, I walk all over it. So I'm I'm very much in the work, and so much of that is about again figuring me out, my own kind of visual vocabulary, but. So much of it too is about these entanglements of love and family and all of those kinds of tensions. Think things that you know probably I'll still be arguing with my parents about. My dad's fairly liberal. My mom is pretty conservative. So my last few combos with her were about Bo Biden and Hunter Biden and how Hunter Biden made all this money and how Pelosi is holding up the stimulus check. So mm -hmm. I'm I'm constantly in these conversations that are pulling me in these really bizarre ways. Um, mm -hmm. And again, to the, the tentacles of kind of a history of United Food Company, right. all of those things are sort of always very much in my work. Um, and I'm, for the way that I work too, again, with this kind of um, bound paper and things like that, that so much for me is about these kind of doing away with these questions of kind of, again, neat categories, neat identities, um, the kind of purist sort of approach, like don't get the paper dirty, don't do all of those things, don't touch your negatives when you're making photographs. I can assure you there is nothing pure about me. And so I'm okay with that. I'm okay with being vulnerable and, and working on paper, which also has this, again, this kind of vulnerability and fragility. And to a uh, relationship, you know, in ways to, to the body and um, the way that the body acts as like a receptacle for, you know, exactly. all these, all these histories and experiences, but also almost like um, scarring. Um, exactly. That's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. 
and there's, there's performative aspects too in, in, in the way that you make the work and the way you collect the materials. Yeah. Um, and like you said, just physically, um, the way you articulate your gestures and that these works are also of such large scale right. that when you see them in person, it almost is like um, engulfed, engulfs yep. the, you know, um, yeah. the peripheral view of the viewer. Yeah, that's that is exactly what I'm mm -hmm. when I'm getting it. I'm trying to do it. This piece actually was supposed to be bigger, at least in my head, because my walls um, are 15 wide and 10 feet tall. I could actually make things um, taller if I took all the tiles out. I but at the time I'm like kind of making the piece and it's kind of spreading and, and growing. And then I'm like, oh snap, how tall are the walls in the gallery? I had totally forgot to go back and and um, measure them. So by the time I realized, oh, the height is only eight feet back to the studio, rethink the piece, make it a little bit smaller. It ended up working out fine. It, it looks very different from the earliest images of when I first started making the piece. I document my process the whole time. Mm -hmm. um, at, at the moment, there's a piece in the studio, which I haven't made very much headway on, but it's an attempt to try to remake this piece, but add a little bit more negative space in there um, so that there is some place for your eyes to rest. I feel like it, it needs more black, more white, maybe some other kind of solid areas. Um, so that, that's sort of, again, the story behind this guy. It also tried mm -hmm. to kind of kill me a few times. Like I fell off the ladder like two or three times making this piece. So mm -hmm. it, was, it was a real fight to try to finish it. I, I often have multiple deadlines happening so I'm, you know, making one work at home, you know, scanning images, and then I'm go to the studio, work for another several hours, come home, sleep, and then do it all again. Maybe sometimes go into Cambridge to go to work. So it's, that's part of, I think, the kind of messiness that ends up in the work. It's, it's like things are constantly moving around. Hmm. Del, we're getting some questions um, on your presentation. Would you mind actually going back to sharing some of the slides? And maybe we can just kind of um, navigate in relationship yep. to, uh, to some sure. of the works. So. Um, so let's see, let's start. David Arford asked, asked a great question. He was asking, what are your influences in terms of um, performance? You know, I know you mentioned um, working with Maria Magdalene of Compost Bones, right. um, also Daniel Abrams. I know we've talked about um, uh, Marilyn Arsum as well. Absolutely, yeah, they're, they're definitely the three artists um, whose work I'm constantly drawing on Marilyn very much for these questions around time and space and, and figuring out what is the difference between doing an action for a minute versus five minutes versus 12 hours. So all of those kinds of tiny gestures and longer gestures related to time. Um, so Marilyn's really critical in that. From Magda, it's very much about this working between mediums and then translating let's say a photograph into an installation or into a performance. Also that kind of strong use of color, which to me is really kind of, a, it's, a, it's one of my tools of seduction. Um, color, you know, we all sort of perceive color in really individual ways and they sort of recede and come forward depending upon what they're next to. So a lot of that I learned from working with Magda. Her training is obviously most of it in painting um, but she found a way to translate a painting practice into, you know, performance and installation. So that's where a lot of that comes from. Also very much looking at Coco Fusco's work, um, mm -hmm. like that piece, Couple in a Cage, um, you know, kind of this iconic piece that you learn about in grad school and you're like, how am I ever going to even like top that? You can't, you have to kind of figure out your own way. But in terms of Coco's work, the kind of research that she does and these kind of very, um, decisive and more kind of incisive um, ways of reading, um, you know, current history as well as historical um, and history of colonization and so forth. So she's very much in there. Um, Carolee Sneeman is another artist. Um, the way that she thought of her performance work, she thought of it very much as painting um, and very much too about using the body as paintbrush, you know, as implement in some way, shape or form. So I, I would say those are the main artists who I'm always constantly going back to and looking at their work and, and thinking it through. Um, yes, yeah, John Tyson has a great question um, about the piece at the MFA, um, Columbus Day Blues. Yeah. Um, he was wondering if, I, I think you mentioned that it was a commission, but he was curious if it was, um, if it was agreed upon from the MFA or was it, was it a bit more um, like a gorilla? 
No, performance. no, I, I will say I do not do very many um, guerrilla performances. The way that piece came about was that Liz Munsell had um, been appointed uh, performance art curator at the MFA, hanging out with Magda. She tells me, oh, you need to meet Liz Munsell. She's the new curator of performance art. I don't know Liz from a hole in the wall, but I do know that anytime Magna tells me to do something, I should go and do it. So as it turned out, Liz has, had already been organizing a performance art program as well as a panel. And that particular um, event, the panel discussion I went to and saw the performances that night. Um, Marilyn Arson was one of the first artists, um, that first group of artists who did a performance um, within the MFA. So it was Marilyn, Marilyn, uh, Marilyn and John Gonzalez, who was my classmate. And then there was one other artist, it was three artists that night. And then after the performances, there was a panel discussion. So I attended um, the panel discussion. I always asked lots of questions. It was a really rich discussion. Um, at the end of the panel, I just sidled up to Liz and I said, you know, Magda suggested I come and say hello and introduce myself. Um, she's like, yeah, thank you so much for doing that. Glad you enjoyed the panel. Um, and then I think I might have given her my either my email or a phone number or something. I thought I, you know, I had just asked her for a studio visit. She came by my studio a few weeks after that. Uh, this dresser was in the studio at the time because it's been used in another performance. We talked, so we talked about that particular piece. That piece is called Linger. And I performed it at Medicine Wheel um, in South Boston. And so I went through that performance. I didn't know how. Liz was receiving the work. Um, I know that we just talked quite a bit. Liz also um, was engaged with photography, you know, made images mm -hmm. herself, um, you know, spent time in Latin America studying the culture. So um, yeah, as I said, we had a really good discussion. I can't remember how long she was in there, but it was, it was substantive enough. And then afterward, um, we exchanged some more emails and then I got an invite um, and she invited me to do a solo performance at the MFA. At the time, I didn't necessarily know what that meant. I had never performed in a museum. Most of my other performances had either been in class or um, at an outdoor site. Um, I once did a performance on Valentine's Day where I wished a tree happy Valentine's Day for an hour. Um, so I had done some of those kinds of guerrilla performances. Um, but as a result of meeting with Liz and several site visits and her kind of giving me free reign of the Lindy family wing with all this amazing contemporary art, um, that was all the difference in the world with again, visiting the site. Right before that happened, I had also um, interviewed David Ajay, who's, a, who's the architect mm -hmm. who designed the National Museum of African-American History and Culture in Washington, DC. Um, so he and I had, just you know, finished up kind of a Q&A interview piece that was in, published in a journal called Transition. And that conversation was very much about how spaces themselves cue us in a way that tell us sort of how to be behave within a space. And I had not thought about those questions. I hadn't thought about architecture itself and how institutions themselves have personalities and they're sort of, again, kind of cueing mm -hmm. you to, to behave in a particular way. But I remember having interviewed him and then doing these site visits with Liz at the MFA that that made me um, think quite a bit about, huh, what happens if I create a space, uh, create a performance piece that is responding to this museum space? Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting to hear too, just like along this trajectory that you've been kind of a part of this uh, more recent trend of these institutions that have been around for a long time, accepting right. and, and, and hiring, you know, curators, you know, like Liz being the first curator of performance art at the MFA right. um, shows a bit of like a shifting of the, of, of, of the, dis, of the, of the course of art history in terms of like these institutions accepting it as a field Absolutely. that's been around for a long time since the 60s. Yeah. Yeah. That um, was a, that was a huge, huge deal. Yeah. Like I said, I was quaking in my boots. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, Liz probably doesn't know that, but with each, with each of those site visits, I was like, oh my God, how am I going to figure this out? The, the good thing is I'm just a nerd and I'm just really obsessive. So if I have to visit a space like, you know, like four or five times, I will do it if necessary. Doing it in, in 
doing that blues blank black performance piece in Cuba was a little bit more challenging because obviously I didn't, you know, I couldn't do site visits months and months in advance. Um, but because I have I've been making performances for a long period of time, I'm able to figure out how to make a piece work as long as I have, again, some real sense of the the historical context and sort of what the space looks like. I'm often just, again, trying to read a space um, to some extent and then developing a work based on what the, the space is telling me. Um, in terms of the, you know, material materials that you bring into your performances, you know, you, it's, it's, it seems like there's this trend of bringing in, um, you know, objects, props, things that get activated throughout the sure. actions and the performances. Mm -hmm. um, Nicholas uh, Rivas act, asked what uh, the significance of the white paint or, and, and pink um, and chalk are in, in the piece Blues, Blake, Black. Yeah, that's a great question. Let's see if we can go. Yeah, so the white paint, all of that, that has a lot to do with the the construct of Latinx identity, um, where you could actually be black, brown, or white. But part of what's a problem with that particular identity is that it's always steeped in anti-blackness. Um, and so there's always these questions like my family really does look like the United Nations, but I'm I'm deeply aware of how one cousin may be referred to versus another cousin. Um, based upon how dark or light they are, or, or clear skinned, as one of my cousins um, would say. Um, the white paint is also, too, about sort of um, just being a Black person, right? And so when you grow up as a Black, a black girl or Black boy, um, your mom does not want you leaving the house looking ashy, right? So you've got to use all this lotion and such to make yourself look, you know, clean and pull together and dignified, right? So that you're not considered, you know, kind of, you know, just street urchin or something like that. So it's very much about those kinds of questions um, in terms of the white paint in particular. The chalk and charcoal I'm using often to either draw shapes uh, that, that there's a blue shape that I would draw on some of the paper, the paper is vellum paper, so it has this transparent quality. So I may use like, um, you know, oil bar, blue oil bar, and sort of, you know, obsessively trace eyes on um, or draw eyes on a piece of paper. The charcoal I may be using to write out a particular woman's name, but I'm, also, I'm always incorporating some object or material in my performances. I, I know like with Marilyn, she, her work is very much about stillness and time and contemplating like mortality, all of those kinds of things. But that's just, that's not my practice. I'm very, I'm very much engaged in the material world as well as sort of a more kind of transcendent sort of metaphysical experience of, of perform, performance art. So again, I had to kind of work for you. I think just like with any artist, right? Or, or, or any project that you're approaching, there's all this, there's the weight of history and there's the weight of your teachers and your mentors. And you've got to like try all of these different things to find a way forward. And, and you're really the only one who knows what the work is supposed to do or not do. Um, over time, you develop a confidence in that. But there, there isn't a way to, to figure that out unless you actually do it. And, and in terms of your, um, your research uh, you know, el elements in your practice, um, you know, Adrena Warren asks, can you talk a bit uh, about the amount of time you would like to explore or the amount of time you have enjoyed in your research? Mm. Um, so like, I guess, just like what, what, what portion of your practice do you um, spend uh, investing time in research? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I'd say one of the last courses I did in grad school, I ended up taking it at Harvard because it was just easier than commuting to, the, to Tufts. I was um, doing a project on the, uh, the World's Fair of 1900 in Paris. I was supposed to write a 20 page paper. I wrote a 100 page paper. So there's moments in which a particular idea will go in my head and I may sp spend months and months and months researching it, writing about it with not even any real plan of even presenting it sometimes. But I'll, I'll, I never know what my brain is going to latch onto. So for that particular paper, I was 
writing about it and doing research like months and months after the class had finished. Um, for Columbus Day Blues, the piece that that preceded that was an installation piece that was also um, developed out of the history of United Fruit Company. So that was a, a piece made out of uh, coat hangers and banana uh, plantation leaves and um, uh, denim blue jeans, Banana Republic denim blue jeans. Honduras is, is the first uh, Banana Republic. Um, and that's only because O. Henry spent some time there as he was evading the law for um, tax evasion. And so he, he writes a book called Cabbages and Kings. And that's where, and it's all set in Honduras. Um, and he calls it a Banana Republic. So that's the sort of, again, the kind of um, research that I'm doing um, for that, for my thesis project. That was probably, I would say, a good two semesters of just reading, 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 thinking, writing, um, running ideas by um, colleagues who I know are historians who, who know the history better than I do. So um, sometimes it's really kind of long-winded in other instances, not so much. Like when I did Blues Blank Black for the first time, I had been obviously following the news about the deaths of so many Black women. Um, the, the, perform the project itself, Black Girl Lit, between performance literature and memory, all of us um, as artists, we we're working with um, literature, oral traditions, um, and a lot of it, you know, related to Black women writers. And so um, I knew that I wanted to focus on Toni Morrison, and I knew I wanted to focus on those two books. And so I read the books over again. I'm a pretty fast reader. But again, that was a space at Five Miles. I had only seen that space one time before that. And I had to then, again, create it pretty much on the fly that particular evening. Um, so yeah, sometimes it's it's months at a time. There's other times where it's like, oh, I only like I have two days to figure this out, so I better figure it out. Um, it really just depends on the project itself. I, I won't say that you know not all the all the performances go the way that I want. Sometimes I really feel like, oh, this piece, um, I'm never going to do it again, or I just think it's it's flat. Maybe I need to do something else. But again, I don't think you learn those things about how to make art and think about art and do research unless you actually kind of, again, you know, do the work and you, over time you figure out um, the way your brain works. Are we there? Sorry about that. Okay. Um, I was, was really interested to hear, you know, when you're talking about your drawing practice of like documenting how the piece changes over time. Um, right. And then you were just also referencing like your reaction to different performances, um, you know, them being participatory um, uh, ephemeral works um, in a way that they change from, from venue to venue. Um, right. I was curious, you know, you mentioned that in 2016, you presented Blues Blank Black um, in May of 2016, and then again in December. Right. Um, which would have been after um, the 2016 election. And right. <laughs> I was curious how maybe those, um, the performance changed yeah. in light of like, just like the historical context. Yeah, that is an excellent question. Um, so after the 2016 election, I went to South Africa for a conference called Black Portraitures. It's a conference that organizes every one or two years in, in various cities. Um, it was a lot of, I, had, I was pretty shell-shocked, you know, from Trump's win and then trying to work out, hmm, how am I going to put this performance together in December at the Cooper Gallery? The, the good news is that I had time between the trip in November to Johannesburg and then figuring out the performance in December. That was roughly about a month. At the time, because I work at the Hutchin Center and the, the Cooper Gallery um, for African and African American Art is a part of the Hutchin Center. At the time, our founding director of the gallery, Vera Grant, she had approached me about um, the exhibition that was up at the time. And it was a, an exhibition by Karen Mays, who, as you obviously know, is like one of my, I'm a fangirl of, as are so many other artists. Um, and that, particular exhibition was called I Once Knew a Girl. And so when Vera and I first talked, um, she, I thought she wanted me to kind of do like this artist kind of reflective kind of, you know, tour through the space and talk about which of, you know, Carrie's works have had an impact on me. 
um, in subsequent meetings, I realized, oh no, she actually wants me to create a performance. Okay, I hadn't even thought about that. I, that, uh, that was another thing I was like, I have no idea what I'm going to do. Um, over time, I realized, again, sort of, you know, you put your, put your kind of um, insecurities aside and you sort of figure out like, where is my courage? Um, at that point, I started to think about Blues Blank Black again. And um, because I had improvised that piece, I really felt like I didn't understand how I constructed it because most of my performances are highly constructed and choreographed and researched. And so I thought, huh, well, if I tell Weir about this idea, maybe she's going to think it's ridiculous, but let me just run it by her. Um, so she and I talked and I talked about, you know, this performance being about, you know, the death of the Black women, that it was a eulogy, that it was about storytelling, um, but also to very, very much about, again, Toni Morrison's work and sort of her, her work and its kind of its influence on me. And so as we talked through it and she said, well, Del, you know, you could use the entire gallery for the performance. I was like, oh, okay, that opens up some other questions. Because when I first did it in um, New York, it was stationary and I was, you know, in a corner area. Because I know the Cooper Gallery really well, it's a space that was also designed by David Ajay. I understood that space in a, in a way that I don't normally understand spaces. I didn't have to do a ton of walkthroughs in it because I really understood the space anyway. Um, at the time, like I said, I had not considered having a colleague ask me to come and perform a piece at the Cooper Gallery. But because of the way the space is set up, I started to think about each section of the gallery as a chapter. Um, and that there's these kind of nuances within these chapters um, that could be kind of, that could kind of hold the piece together and sort of create this spine um, from from beginning, middle to end. So that's how the piece ends up being, you know, a, um, created and performed in three parts with these three separate characters: the the bluesy torch singer, La Susia, and then La Yolana. So that's how that piece. Um, became a lot different and it definitely res you know resonated with people it was a really like cold december day i was shocked any people showed up the cooper gallery is also um it's kind of tight quarters so they definitely limited how many people came but um right after the performance we did a q a and so i was i was surprised at how closely people were paying attention um to the work um for that i'm you know incredibly grateful because that was a piece that um, again, I didn't completely understand when I first performed it in Brooklyn. I, I got a chance to, to, you know, really perform it, I think, um, at the Cooper Gallery. And then um, as a result of doing this performance, I think someone, curator may have seen this performance at the Cooper Gallery or heard about it. And the next thing I knew, you know, I, I'd get a call like, hey, can you perform this piece at this site? So that's why I performed it um, between 2016 um, and now, most recently, it was performed at the Hood Museum at Dartmouth College mm -hmm. uh, in February, right before the pandemic right. showed up. Um, that at, for that particular show was part of um, a show called Re, um, Reconstitution by Jessica Hong, um, who was at the ICA, who's now at the um, Hood Museum, and that was also a roving performance. But with with each um, site the performance does tend to kind of constrain or get longer because space is in relationship to time and that's in relationship to pacing and that's also in relationship to the objects that are in and through the museum. So there's always these, like I said, these different ways that the piece tends to morph. I, I don't know that at the outset of when I was first making performances, I hadn't you know, considered repeating a piece. I always would make a new piece based on the new site and whoever that curator was. This, this piece became more portable than others because um, I could just put all this stuff in my suitcase, which is what I did when I performed it in Cuba. So I'm really, um, I'm really indebted to Beer Grant for um, giving me the space to, again, try out this, this um, a different way of actually constructing this piece. Yeah, and it's really intense at being at also at the, you know, the location where you work. Um, yeah, that was that was kind of hellish because I was like, what yeah. what will this mean <laughs> once I 
um, colleagues and um, our executive director, Abby Wolf Skip was not there that day, I, which is probably a good thing. Um, yeah, I didn't know how that would go down. Um, but like I said, I'm just, I know I'm really fortunate that I get to work at a, an institution that is focused on African and African American studies, which I love. I fell in love with the field. I was only supposed, I came to Harvard in 2003. I was only supposed to be there a year on a fellowship. I ended up sticking around because I loved the field and I loved working for Skip. Um, and I've been there, you know, this whole time. So having the flexibility that I have with a part-time schedule, um, that just affords me a lot of space and time to figure out my work. Um, and that has, you know, continued to, again, kind of give me the support that I need so that you know, when I get an ask to travel someplace to do a performance, you know, I'm, I get the time and space to do that and, you know, and to just focus and maybe set aside project deadlines at work in order to do that. Yeah, it's great that they've been really supportive. That's yeah. really phenomenal. Lucky. Um, you, you mentioned uh, about uh, that performance taking place right before COVID. Um, and I saw a couple of people asked, you know, uh, how COVID has impacted your performance work, but I think you can even just like speak probably more broadly about like your entire practice. Um, right. How you've been adjusting, yeah. adapting. What am I adjusting, adapting? Yeah. Well, I will say that I think COVID has pretty much killed my practice of hmm. performing uh, pieces within institutions, at least for the time being. So I, Right now, um, I don't think anyone feels comfortable um, doing a performance within a gallery space, even though it would be reduced capacity or whatever. So much of the way that I work when I'm making performances is like I'm I'm close to the audience and I don't, you know, I'm not going to wear a mask to try to do that. So my plan now is to try to make, um, do more site-specific pieces outdoors. Um, obviously work with some really good um friends of mine who, you know, can video and document the work. So that's one way I'm shifting things. I'm thinking more as well too about video and installation. Um, how do I merge some of the drawings and the paintings and some other, um, you know, video that I've shot, you know, years ago, but haven't used, how could that be merged with my body if I'm projecting different images on my body against a wall or in a particular location? So that's where things are at the moment. Um, so yeah, COVID has kind of jammed us all up. It is, it's, yeah, it's changed a lot, a lot of things for many artists. I'm, I'm not stressed about, you know, not making a performance within an institution at the moment. I feel like safety first. Um, in the meantime, this does give me time to reflect on some previous work that I can sort of dig back into. Um, I can spend more time obviously making some drawings and some other work and just, yeah, giving myself the kind of space and time to just uh, think about some other ideas. Um, I've performed Blues Blank back about six or seven times. I'm, I'm not sure that I will perform that piece again because as I said, it's, it's a pretty difficult piece to do. Um, so yeah, I'm giving myself this time to, um, yeah, just take a step back, think about other ideas that I haven't been able to really work on in the last, last few years. So, so you, have you shifted a bit more to kind of like object-based work and object spending time in your work. studio? Yep, exactly. Some object-based work. I've got a lot of fabric and all kinds of like, you know, different props and things in the studio that I'm trying to work through right now. I started working small lately, um, like, you know, 18 by 24. Partly um, it was, again, to kind of get, out, get around the corona fatigue and kind of Zoom fatigue. I find that because we're all on these machines all day long now, when it's time for me to go to the studio, I don't necessarily have the mental capacity to work on a large piece. So my strategy has been to try to work smaller. And by doing that, I at least have a sense of accomplishment. I'm also paying really close attention to the materials and the surfaces that I'm working on. So I'm working on everything from like watercolor paper to photo paper to drawing paper to vellum and, and so forth. So I've been kind of you know, playing around with those kinds of different materials that are in the studio. I also inherited um, my mentors, the contents of her apartment. Her name is Susan Danker. She was an art historian and taught at the SMFA. And, so, and she was also a, a bookworm and a pack rat and a collector. So I inherited um, the contents of her apartment. So that's everything from her Chinese food takeout menus to her thousands of art history slides. Um, so I've been 
uh, going through a lot of those materials, some really incredibly um, beautiful books that were part of her collection. Um, you know, a book by um, Arna Bontemps, um, who's a, you know, African-American writer from the Harlem Renaissance. Um, I have one of his books, a children's book. Um, I have a children's book by James Baldwin, but I'm kind of going through her, the books and the slides. Her husband was a huge fan of classical music. So I have hundreds and hundreds of classical albums. And I have the old um, Kodak slide projectors, like three or four of them. So I've been thinking about how to build an installation that is an homage to all that Susan taught me um, she had this also too, this really kind of encyclopedic knowledge of black art. Um, she has a website. It's, um, it's been one of her colleagues, our friends, or was the executor of the estate. So she inherited the, um, this particular database, but it's the African American Visual Art Database. So aabad.org. There's like 11,000 entries of black artists in there. But I've been thinking more about Again, I'm already an, I'm already a pack rat. I'm already very much interested in archives. Obviously, I I'm you know obsessed with art and art history. What would happen if I'm you know as I'm kind of going through this storage unit with so many of her items? Um, how could I build an installation, you know, built on these questions between um, her relationship with her mom versus my own relationship to to my mom, and then certainly to all the other women artists that, you know, whose work is depicted in these slides. But um, slowly but surely, I'm going through these things. She passed away in 2016. 2016 was awful, just as like mm -hmm. horrendous as 2020. Um, so it's taken me four years. Um, I needed the emotional distance to get, a, um, to set that grief aside, um, to be able to go through these things. But that's one of the ways that I'm thinking about like, okay, we can't make performances right now. Can I create an installation that has some sort of performative sort of, um, you know, gestures and motivations behind it. And it turns out there is, cause there's, there was an, there's an exhibition, I'll have to look for the book um, in a minute, but there is um, an exhibition that was curated in the early part of the 2000s it's called Slideshow. Um, and it's all about um, how contemporary artists used uh, slides and slide projectors in their um, in their installation work, and it so it has some relationship to performance and painting. As I'm kind of reading through the book, is where I'm sort of learning all of these other kind of threads. So I'm hoping that that will be um, again creating some sort of installation that's that has a has activity to it. It feels immersive. It feels historical. It feels present. Um, so that's that's one of the other things that I'm thinking about in terms of shifting things over. There's certainly to an offer, you know, ability to try to do performance for video. So I do have a video camera. Um, I've got a couple of ideas that I haven't tried to, um, haven't tried to do. Um, they've kind of just been rolling around in my head. So that's, those are some of the other ways that I'm thinking about, um, again, shifting the whole performance thing. I, I don't see myself as one of those artists who's going to do like an Instagram live thing or a Facebook live thing. That's just, this is not my lane. Um, so I'm, again, trying to think about other ways to open up these other questions about work that's kind of already been in my head for a while that I haven't had time to work on. You know, it's, I mean, it's, it's uh, such a huge challenge, everybody being forced to, you know, socially distance and, you know, really alter yeah. their day-to-day -day lives. But I think it's going to be, you know, a really impactful time period for artists in terms of fi figuring out how to adapt, how to slow down, how to kind of right. shift. Um, exactly. Yeah. Um, my colleague, do you, have, do you have time for maybe like another 15 minutes? Sure. Um, great. Absolutely. Great. Yeah, we just have lots of great questions in here in the, in the queue. Yeah. Um, speaking of your practice in the studio um, with making more drawings, um, my colleague John Tyson um, challenges, he wants to know uh, why does drawing matter in like mm. 2020? <laughs> that is a wonderful question. Um, <laughs> The reason why drawing matters for me is because of its immediacy. It feels like performance for me in a way. It also feels very much like writing for me. And so what I'm often doing with my drawings, I'm trying to get images out of my head and onto a surface. I have a learning disability, so I have ADHD. And there's some dyslexia in there as well, some dysgraphia issues as well. But for me, if I don't get ideas and images that are in my head out, I can't really make sense of the world. So that's why I'm often 
you, you'll find me if I'm not in my studio drawing, I'm at my computer writing or I'm like at work doing some kind of a research project, but my, my brain is very noisy. Um, so drawing is one way for me to get things from my head onto a surface so that they don't keep me up at night. And like you mentioned earlier too, it's, um, you know, we're all kind of living in a world of screens right now. Exactly. Um, so, you know, working with physical objects and that kind of physical, tangible immediacy. Right. Sure it's probably really gratifying. Yeah, that's actually a great point that you mentioned, Sam, because I was on a Zoom thing a couple weeks ago with Daniela Rivera, also mm -hmm. an SMFA, um, SMFA alum. Um, Daniela teaches drawing. She's at Wellesley. She's an incredible artist, really generous educator. What she has noticed in her drawing classes is that her students, because they're learning through a screen, are clearly not getting the gift of you know, in-person observational drawing. They're, they're, the, whatever they're doing now in class, it, I guess the images are fairly flat and you can see that they're kind mm -hmm. of owning it in. So there is something to be said for being able to connect with your brain to what it's doing, to you know, what is happening with your hand, how you're holding the implement, and then putting those kinds of things onto a service. And again, looking, right? Because drawing is about looking and seeing. So for, for me, the, again, those ways that I can remain connected and in my body and still present and not on the screen you know, for um, hours and hours at a time, for me, drawing has been perfect for that. That's really great to hear. Yeah, and it's and it's. I mean, it's important. I think for everyone to to maintain some some practices that get yeah. you off the screen um, and Absolutely. you know allow allow you to you know make some space um, just even mentally and physically. Yep. Exactly. In another part of your life. Yep. Um, a few people have asked uh, if you've had if you have a favorite performance piece that you've produced um, and why. Mm. Like, if there's a single performance that you feel really um, stands out in your mind. Um, in terms of it just being probably executed, yeah, um, um, your ideal. I think the one. I mean, to to be honest, like this is all we have. The one that I did, where I'm morphing between Obama and Trump and so forth. I mean, it's. I don't know that it's necessarily the strongest piece, but right now it's kind of my favorite because I feel like it could, like I could do a lot with it in this moment. I feel like there's just so many things that I can play around with. You know, I can certainly incorporate Biden now, but I'm, I'm right. trying to kind of trace out, you know, like how, how did we get from, you know, the country, you know, that we were founded upon, you know, to now. And obviously Trump is a symptom. He's not like a, um, he's not at the core of it. He's sort of like, he's actually quite predictable if you kind of look at, you know, politics over the last 50 years or something like that, right? So right now that one is, you know, it's in my head and I want to figure that piece out. It, there's, you know, maybe it's a piece that could be done outdoors somewhere if I can find the right, you know, historical site within Boston. And Boston is, again, it's an old city. So it always, it has all these amazing connections to all these other histories, but- um, mm -hmm. Or maybe yeah, DC really, would be interesting. Exactly. Too. Yeah, yeah. I've, thought of, I've thought about adding in Louise Day Hicks, you know, the anti-busing, mm -hmm. um, you know, woman. So, yeah, for me, I feel like there's all these different, just again, our, our country right now is morphing into something else. I, I mean, it, to me, it's, you know, I'm a, I'm a Gen Xer. So the whole Cold War thing, that never ended for the Russians. Right. But um, I like, we're not a superpower. And I don't know that we get to be a superpower. Maybe that's probably a good thing. But um, me, you know, those of us as individuals and Americans documented or undocumented, this is a very different landscape that, you know, folks coming after me are inheriting. Um, so what does this mean going forward? You know, the Trumpkins, they're gonna be here. We're like stuck with those people. Um, after the election in 2016, you know, I started to pay attention to some of this kind of economic angst of like, you know, white working class after a while, I realized like, nope, this, this is not about economic angst. This is just about white supremacy. That's what mm -hmm. that is. Um, and that's, it's, it's sad to say, but because of the US's history, all of those isms are already in us. And if we're not actively trying to unpack that stuff and look at our own blind spots, 
the next several generations are going to be really, really rough. I, I, I'm one of those folks, even though I was born here, my parents have been in this country for almost 50 years. They still really believe in the American dream. And that's an incredibly potent um, dream. Certainly African-Americans, as far as I'm concerned, are, can be considered patriots in the same way that John McCain is a patriot, right? So Absolutely. black folks, right? So black folks, indigenous folks, brown folks, constantly trying to defend the Republic from a man like Trump, right? Who's, a, as far as I can tell, is a high functioning psychopath. Hmm. So, um, and, and, you know, I think that you're doing some of that work throughout your own practice, you know? Trying to, certainly. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think th there's, maybe there's time for just two more questions. Um, sure. there, Anthony Kalaki asked two questions, um, which I think have some relation and, you know, the first one's kind of tough and the second one is maybe right. a little bit more celebratory. Um, sure. the first one was, uh, does the ever growing number of black women killed by police discourage you from continuing your practice, your performance art, um, or does it inspire and ins inspire you to keep pushing and moving forward? That is a wonderful question. Um, as I said, I don't know that I'll perform that piece again, because there is a part of me that feels like I've said all that I need to say, like, what else? I mean, again, with Breonna Taylor's death, right. it's just like those cops are like, they're still walking free, you mm -hmm. know? Um, to me, it, it really feels like I've, I've said and done everything I've, I've, I can in that performance to raise awareness about Breonna Taylor and certainly other of black women whose names we don't know. So, may, so maybe the work shifts more to those, their stories versus the ones, you know, the stories that we may have had more top of mind, but it's a great question. Um, there is a part of me too, um, and this is something I think for us all to think about, right? As, as like artists and makers and curators, right? Part of our challenge is that we know the power of art. We know what it can do. We know we, how we can comment on social conditions. The, the thing that we have to keep in mind, though, is that art also has limitations. You know, art can't vanquish psychopathy. It can't vanquish white supremacy. As artists, we've got all of our different roles and all the different hats that we wear. I choose to make work about sociopolitical conditions, but I understand, you know, artists who don't do that work at all, at all and feel like they've got to move in a different direction. But it just seems to me that we have to remind ourselves not to ask art to do something it can't really do. Um, the second thing as well is like we can, we're always, again, we're, you know, rounding the wagons, getting artists to participate in these conversations, being wary of how institutions kind of instrumentalize us for their own ends, right? So being aware of which institutions you partner with to actually show your work. Um, so, um, so yeah, I, for me, as I said, that, that piece, I'm not sure that it's a piece I need to, to do again. It's like I said, it continues to be really a difficult piece. I still grapple with my own grief um, around the deaths of Sandra Bland and Breonna Taylor. I, I've had a cop put a gun in my face the night before I performed at the Hood Museum. I was flagged by a New Hampshire police officer who claimed I was in the, I was in the left lane and I didn't take the turn when I was supposed to. I don't know what he was talking about. There was no one on the road. It was the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. And I was literally a few feet from the, from the um, Dartmouth College Hotel that I was supposed to be checking in. I was terrified sitting in my car as he was looking at my registration and driver's license. Um, and yet again, the following day, I did a performance. Mm -hmm. um, students came, they asked great questions. They were engaged. And I'm always really grateful to the folks who um, come to see my performances and want to talk to me. But it does, again, it continues to remind me that I can't, um, yeah, I can't, I, I can't make, you know, police officers stop killing Black folks, right? Art, art can't do that. So it, it has all of its kind of glory and beauty, but it has serious limitations as well. Yeah, I'm so sorry you had to experience that. That was, I mean, completely yeah. unnecessary. Yeah, it's, um, it's yeah, and so that's the thing. I think um, I think if anything, you know, I'm just I'm grateful to all the activists and the young people who are out on the streets this past summer. Um, that continues to give me hope, even though things often look pretty bleak. Mm. Um, but yeah, so that's that's kind of where I am with 
with that particular performance. And so what and what was the second question? Um, the second one was, uh, how do you feel about modern musicians um, like Beyonce mm -hmm. using their influences um, from performance art, um, like, right. pieces, like pieces like Homecoming, Black is King, right. um, and just right. I think just like performance art um, becoming embraced um, in public culture, you know, popular culture. Yeah, I think um, I think I'm okay with it. I'm not one of those folks. Like I said, I'm not a purist about these things. There's and certainly I think the rise of like you know performance studies programs, like you know that's what those folks do. They're kind of they're analyzing you know performance for music performances and and video and ballet performance art. There's all these different ways to make performances. So I'm totally open to those kinds of things. I don't I don't want to be the policeman of performance art. I don't want to police you know the art that people look at. Um, you know, I'll, although I will say I'm. I'm perfectly fine with the Philip Gustin show being pushed back a few years. It's it's not the most pressing thing right now for me, um, you know. Mm -hmm. So it, you know, again, you kind of put all these things into into perspective. The other thing too is that I mean, I assume probably like over this is contemporary moment now as well as in the past. Artists and musicians are always talking. You know, we're talking to poets, we're talking to musicians, we're talking to actors, we're talking to composers. So mm -hmm. you know. The, the way that we sort of break up these different categories and silos, like that's not really how art happens. It, it's really this all this kind of cross pollinization. And it's not unusual that someone like Jim Carrey, who's known for being an actor, is, you know, making paintings, right? So artists are always trying to think through what are the different mediums that I have available to me to explore the ideas that I want to talk about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, just when I read that question too, I was thinking about Grace Jones, um, exactly. you know, Jimi right. Hendrix, Duke Ellington, oh. uh, across generations. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. um, yeah well, Del, you know, it's, I, I was really appreciating that you, you know, uh, so much of your work is constantly um, thinking about these large societal issues um, mm -hmm. and things like around history and policy um, and culture and how they relate to very personal matters. And I think that that's a huge theme of 2020 as well. Yeah. Um, like especially around like the revived Black Lives Matter, um, yeah. okay. you know, uprising um, is just people recognizing that there are these huge societal uh, structures and, and tendencies that like really affect people on very human scales. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so like I said, just thank you for the work that you do. Um, right. And, you know, I think uh, more people need to be paying attention um, to artists like yourself who are, you know, really trying to do uh, the difficult work and do both uh, somewhat personal um, approaches to dealing with cathartic issues, but also trying to raise issues. Um, as much as, like you said, artwork has some limitations, um, it also can act like a mirror and hopefully wake wake some people up. Thank you so much, Sam, for, mm -hmm. for organizing this and for these wonderful questions. Thank you so much to everyone out there. Yeah, thanks everybody for tuning in. Um, thank you again, Del, for the amazing insights into your practice. Um, hope to catch up soon. Sounds and, good. And um, yeah, again, this is uh, you know Sam Toby. I'm the gallery director of University Hall Gallery at UMass Boston. Um, and this was Del M. Hamilton um, doing a really wonderful presentation on her performance artwork and uh, Q and A. So thanks everybody for for attending, and um, we'll post this soon. Be well. Thanks, Del. Yeah, everybody, take care. <laughs>